Hello everyone, I'm Captain Logan. It's not Spawn here. It is day 19 of my comic review video day calendar. And today we're going to go back to 1979 and look at some classic pre-crisis Justice League. This is Justice League of America, number 170. And I picked this one based on cover alone. I have a really nice looking copy of this issue and I bought a few of these uh, a while back, two or three years ago, and hadn't broken any of them out. I don't actively collect Justice League, but these were in such good shape, I could not help myself. And again, just classic, uh, real traditional, great covers for uh, DC stuff for uh, Batman and Superman. And I was like, yeah, the price is right. I'm going to go ahead and grab a few of these. And the only major issue with the quality of my copy of this is that uh, the previous owner, Mike, wrote his name on it in, in ink pen. So thanks, Mike. Really appreciate that. It's probably a lot less valuable now because Mike had to make sure everybody knew that Mike owned this issue of Justice League. But, uh, yeah, like I said, I bought a few of these and from a killer collection. Uh, I didn't buy out the whole collection because I would have needed thousands of dollars, but I was able to cherry-pick some things. And like I said, I got some uh, really nice prices on these. I think I spent $10 a piece for the Justice Leagues that I got from this period, and some of them were from even, I think, uh, quite a bit earlier than this, or at least a little bit earlier than this. But this guy had uh, the... Kit from the Mary Marching, the the Mary Marvel Marching Society. Remember that the uh, the club that Stan Lee and those guys started in the sixties. Uh, this guy's dad, I think, was a card carrying member of that and had his old kit in like pristine shape. And I think he wanted a grand for it because those especially complete, like, are not. Easy to get your hands on, of course, and I was like, that's amazing. I would kind of kill to get that, but I bought some comics instead. I was not going to drop a grand that day. I think that's I think that's what he wanted for that. He had a couple or three issues of the first appearance of Barbara Gordon. I don't even know why he had more than one. Anyway, it was, it was crazy. So I got some neat things from that collection. That was in Topeka, close to where my dad lives when he, he and I were running a flea market booth together. And so finally getting into some of the stuff that I got when I went to that guy's house, I went ahead and picked this based on I, the that, like I said, just the the, uh, the quality of it. I was kind of excited to finally take a look at this. And also because Batman is driving a very ridiculous vehicle on the front of this, and I had to know what that whole thing was about. This looked really classic and old school and fun, and it did not disappoint. I enjoyed this issue quite a bit. This is, of course, in the middle of... Well, I say, of course, this is in the middle of an arc, but is pretty easy to read by itself, uh, and I didn't have any trouble uh, following it or getting what was going on, but this, this issue doesn't technically stand all by itself. This one is written by Jerry Conway, the legendary Jerry Conway, who, of course, worked at both Marvel and DC and worked on virtually every book and character at Marvel and tons and tons of them at DC as well. And art here is by Dick Dillon and Frank McLaughlin. And I'm not sure where one of those men begins and where the other ends. Uh, the late uh, Dillon and McLaughlin, both of these guys are no longer with us. Jerry Conway is still around. He is, I think, 70 or 71 years old now. And uh, McLaughlin just died. Yeah, Conway is 70. McLaughlin just died a couple of years ago. And Dick Dillon uh, sadly died of a heart attack in 1980. So this issue comes out just a few months before he passes away. This is, if you can believe, the month uh, on listed on the issue. Because, of course, as I've mentioned before, uh, these things always come out two or three months before the month that's listed. Or very, very often, you know, usually they do. But th that's listed September of 79, and Dillon dies in March of uh, 1980 at the uh, just the age of 51 he was pretty young so 
that's pretty sad. But anyway, I uh, really enjoyed the art in this. I uh, he wrote from or pardon me, drew from 68 to 80 when he died and he did 115 issues of this book. So a lot of the major popular stuff that you think of with classic Justice League Silver Age stuff was drawn by this guy and when you think Justice League or at least when I do this is this is kind of what I'm looking at uh, or what I'm thinking of I really like his panel layouts. I uh, really like how expressive his faces are. Uh, the the action is all real dynamic. And this is the stuff that naturally a lot of Super Friends is looking at. And particularly stories like this, where the world is at peril, the stakes are real high, and a lot of what we're dealing with are natural disasters and things. And the disasters, in this case, are created by aliens, by uh, an invasion, an invading force, but it's still a lot of stopping fires, stopping earthquakes, uh, those kinds of things, the kind of stuff that you see Superman flying around trying to deal with in the uh, later Christopher Reeve Superman movies, three and four. And in the TV show, it always seems like that's because we can't really have characters punching each other, and there's so much censorship, and this feels like Super Friends without all the censorship. This would have come out pretty late, well, kind of in the middle, I guess, of the Super Friends run, because the, the Super Friends is mid-70s and then goes all the way to mid to late 80s uh, with various incarnations. Austin and I, not too long ago, did a mini-marathon on uh, Super Friends. So quick plug for that. Check that out because we watched several really amusing episodes and talked about all of that. But let's talk story here for a minute. So Batman is in the Justice League satellite in the headquarters and he's monitoring and all of a sudden there's wildfires everywhere all over the planet. Something has happened to the atmosphere and there's too much oxygen and so the wildfires are eating that up like it's uh, like their two-year-olds getting their hands on a giant birthday cake and the fires are spreading all over the world and wreaking havoc. And Batman is trying to figure out how he's going to stop it. And I really like how Conway makes a big deal out of Batman's physical and also mental limitations. This does not have the I'm Batman problem. Now, this issue does end with the Justice League all making a big deal out of how important Batman is and how they don't know how they'd get along without him, but it doesn't read like something, something, he's Batman, and that's why the problem gets solved. He has a very difficult time with this because he says, oh, if only I had superpowers, this would be easier to deal with. But none of the Justice League is around. I can't contact them because they're on trial right now. They're in a courtroom, and there's some courtroom drama in this issue, and I'll get to that in a minute. But Batman says... Okay, I don't have superpowers, and I'm not a theoretical genius. He says he is a scientist, but he's not the right kind of scientist to deal with, with this. And I really appreciated that. So when you get to the end and the Justice League is like, oh, thank God we have Batman because he was able to stop this threatened space, this asteroid uh, that's causing all these problems, uh, it, it again, it doesn't read like... He's this super genius that has all these, all this gadgetry, and he can solve every problem. It reads almost like a consolation thing for Batman, where it's like, yeah, Batman, you matter too. Even though you're not like the rest of us, and you can't fly into battle, and you don't have superpowers, uh, you are a, in a very important, non-expendable member of this team. And so I really like that dynamic. And so the reason the Justice League are on trial is because they have illegally imprisoned another superhero from another dimension named Ultra. And I don't know if this guy has shown up in other media. Uh, this reminded me of a couple of episodes of the Animated Justice League show. And I don't know if, if anything was looking at this directly, because there's a lot of multiversal crossover stuff in that show and a lot of uh, 
superheroes from other dimensions kind of based on our heroes that cross over with us and deal with, uh, you know, uh, they're having different moralities than ours and uh, different rules and regulations in their world for superheroing than ours do. So for... Uh, 1979 with Justice League, I mean, we are starting to get more serious, real-world kinds of stories and real-world characterizations in DC at this time, but these kinds of books aren't doing as much of that yet. So you've got some uh, outliers like Green Lantern, Green Arrow that are starting to get into, uh, you know, things like drug culture and stuff and letting their characters be a bit more flawed and not having as much stilted dialogue and characters that feel ex that, that that feel uh, interchangeable but by and large the majority of DC's books were still doing that it would be a few years before what I uh, what guys like Dennis O'Neill were doing with Green Arrow and Green Lantern uh, would be the norm. So you've got some pioneering books, but not everything is doing that yet. And I think he worked on this book some as well, but I haven't I haven't read what he does on Justice League. So some of the letters in the letters pages at the end of this complain that there's not enough personalities for our characters, that everybody kind of talks the same, everybody kind of does the same thing, there's not a lot of interpersonal conflict, nobody really has any issues with each other. So there is conflict here, and it's not all just natural disasters and alien invasions, but it's not really within our team. So this does read... In, in that way, also a lot like Super Friends. Everybody gets along. It's very kumbaya. It, it's very uh, like Star Trek The Next Generation instead of Star Trek The Original Series where you don't have McCoy and Spock bickering. You don't have Superman and Batman bickering over anything. It's uh, all of the problems, pardon me, all the problems are external. And... So anyway, you've got this guy uh, named Ultra who has come from another universe and he doesn't believe in superheroes anymore because he thinks that they create supervillains. There's maybe a little bit of a commentary about the history of uh, superhero stories where a superhero tends to be at least partly, if not entirely, responsible for the creation of his villain. And so we are deconstructing that a little bit, but at the end of the day, our heroes are, if not vindicated, we still kind of, for, for what they do, for what they've done before this issue, it sidestepped a little bit, and I kind of wonder how it's dealt with after this, or if it's just swept under the rug. So I'll break this down real quick. The idea is that Ultra Eye is trying to end superheroes because... Again, he thinks that you can't have superheroes without supervillains, and so all of the bad costumed people are only around because you have good costumed people. And he comes over and starts causing problems, and I don't know what exactly he does to the Justice League because I didn't read that issue. But they imprison him without any due process. And shockingly, there are consequences to that, and they end up going to trial, which makes that whole thing with the Flash TV show, to me, even more hilarious, even more laughable, because I always thought it was really funny that Barry Allen has his own personal prison at Star Labs in that show, and he's never called on it. And by the time anybody finally talks about it, it kind of watches like it's just because people watching the show have complained about it, so we have to kind of hand wave it away and have somebody, you know, mention it real briefly, but, like, they still do it. There aren't, there aren't any real honest-to-God consequences for it. And it's really funny that all the way back here in a book where more or less your characters are still stalwart and do no wrong, they are called on that mistake. But it ultimately doesn't end up being as much about that. I would have liked to see more of the argument. And there's a place where one woman says, hey, we are guilty as charged, unfortunately. And she seems to be ready to take responsibility for their having done that. But then ultimately, Ultra kind of himself sidesteps the issue and says, and, and I assume there's a cliffhanger before that sets this up, where he says... Uh, 
okay, you guys did make a mistake, but I'm realizing that you're not actually my enemy. The real enemy is my lawyer. And then it turns out that his lawyer is, get this, a bunch of creepy pieces uh, that have all come together to make this lawyer guy, but they're all individual aliens that create a collective consciousness. And now it feels like we actually are in a Star Trek, the original series episode. And so these aliens are trying to prove that they are superior because they have a hive mind. And I feel like I've seen this in a lot of places before, the Borg, but also things like uh, the classic science fiction novel, uh, it's the, the name of that book is escaping me right now. Why can't I think of it? Uh, Childhood's End and things like that. And so, and a, a lot of these, a lot of Justice League stories uh, took their cues from that period of science fiction. And so they're, uh, they're trying to prove that the Justice League are easily distracted and will just squabble over these petty issues and kind of moralize and worry about pointless ethics, even while the, you know, these pointless ethical conundrums, even while the rest of the world is burning. And it's kind of a weird argument because since they've been busy with this trial, they just don't realize that there's a problem going on outside that's Justice League level that they need to go solve. Like, if they found out about that, they'd probably just try to get the judge to give them a recess so they could go stop the world from being on fire. But, you know, okay, and so Ultra has somehow figured out that, that, that uh, his lawyer is actually these aliens, and then they fight the aliens. We find out that Superman is actually a hologram here. It's not the real Superman. He's been out trying to figure out what the problem is. Well, you know, I, okay, so I say that if they knew about what was going on outside, I guess they do to some degree. I get the sense that they don't know how just how bad it is, but they've sent Superman off to investigate. Um, I forgot about that part. And the aliens claim that Superman is dead which is a thing that all the way up until Superman 75 in the early 90s, uh, we, we cannot stop teasing audiences with. Oh man, uh, Superman who is indestructible, maybe he has died. Uh, spoiler alert, he's not dead here either. We just keep covering books where Superman might be dead. And he, turns out, is has, has been uh, lured to the bottom of the ocean by these aliens, and he's incapacitated and in bad shape. There's also a, a place here where uh, Flash almost gets killed by these aliens, and so Wonder Woman goes off to find Superman, and Superman uh, is able to, when she revives him, explain that there there's this alien invasion and these aliens have messed with the with a H2O and the, the reason that the atmosphere is wrecked is because they've broken the H2O molecule and that's why there's too much oxygen in the atmosphere now and so Batman is dealing with this asteroid out in space, uh, kind of a fun role reversal where Superman does the investigating that Batman usually would if he were in this situation. And it's Batman that has to go in space and deal with that asteroid, which is what Superman would usually do. So that's a real fun dynamic. And uh, so both of them kind of figure out what's going on uh, sort of simultaneously. And then by the end of the issue, uh, Batman has stopped the asteroid, and like I said, you get you get that line from Red Tornado, what would we do without the Batman? And uh, Green Lantern says, this is the last line of the issue, that's a question I hope we never have to answer. And so then I assume that they're still dealing with these aliens in the, the, uh, the next issue, the following issue. Uh, I love this page a lot. Like I said, really cool panel layouts. I love... Uh, comic artwork where elements from one panel kind of jump out onto another panel and the whole thing works as a singular piece of artwork but it's still uh, cinematic it's still kinetic there's still a sense of movement through 
uh, all of the uh, the panels, the pictures. I love uh, the line work here from Dylan and McLaughlin, because like I said, I don't know how much each of these guys is doing, so I have to credit both of them. Uh, the color work here is really cool. I love the, the shadow stuff going on with Batman's face there. This is one of my favorite pages that I've seen in a while. It's really neat. And I also like how toyetic this issue is. You know, I want the action figure of Batman in this environmental suit or the space suit. I like that he's got a bat on his belt buckle there. It looks really cool with the helmet off. Like, I don't know, I paid 20, 25 bucks for that action figure. Uh, somebody put that thing out. That would be really neat. Uh, but yeah, one of my, like I said, one of my takeaways from this is there's a really interesting kind of conundrum uh, with... In, in, you know, classic now, a thing that we can't stop dealing with in superhero comics now, where what really is the authority of a superhero team like the Justice League, and what gives them that of, that authority? Is it their, their powers, and that they seem to have their hearts in the right place, and they have the right motivations, or should they get their... You know, and, and should they, they be allowed to act totally autonomously until they do something, you know, really uncouth and above board and, and, and not above board? Or should they be working with the government in the first place? And should they be getting their orders from the government? That kind of Marvel Civil War question. Uh, this situation should bring up all of that stuff. And it really doesn't. I in and it we do kind of put a pin in it. Like I, I was a little bit concerned that by the end of this, uh, the whole point would be we'll see the Justice League is just always right. And so even though they imprisoned this guy and they didn't, there, there was there was no due process at all. Uh, he didn't have any kind of a trial. There was no greater authority than the Justice Leagues. The fact that there's this these aliens that they have to fight trumps everything and ultimately he was wrong about them because they're the good guys because when we get to the end there's a mention of the fact that this is still not resolved it doesn't read that way as much as i thought it would but if we forget all about it after this it absolutely would read that way so it did make me curious to look at the next issue or two after this i uh, so this is a flawed period, of course, with these kinds of superhero stories where they're starting to tiptoe around uh, more, you know, deeper, more f philosophical issues with being a crime fighter and I, you know, how much of that, how much of it you're playing God and that sort of thing. And I don't mean to say that those are the only kinds of stories we should tell with superheroes, but when you broach it, You've you've got to have follow through. You've got to stick the landing on it, uh, or it's kind of weird that you brought it up at all. So if you're just a old school golden age kind of superhero story where it's not really it's not really so much about any sort of social commentary, or uh, it's it's not a traditional narrative where you have a human, uh, for lack of a better word, again flawed person who makes mistakes and wants something, tries to get it, has it a, a um I, it has an opportunity for change and takes it or not, and then we learn something about that person. If you don't want to tell that kind of story and it's just you know, kind of a fun throwaway story that's about being escapist, mostly for children, that's totally cool. Uh, and even with that, I would love our characters to all have their own personalities and uh, have their own thoughts and ideas and speak differently, maybe. Uh, that'd be good. I think you, you can you can do all of those things um, at the same time. And you can even tell that kind of story and have some kind of a uh, you know, worthwhile moral lesson in it, certainly, too, that doesn't have to be super heavy-handed. Uh, but when you're going to broach this kind of thing, it's it it's weird uh, if our characters are still, you know, kind of perfect by the end. And they sort of are and they sort of aren't here if you just take this as its own piece. 
So anyway, thanks a lot for watching, everybody. I'll be back again tomorrow with another one, and assuming that everything works out and you get one of these again tomorrow, like you have every day for the last 19 days, uh, tomorrow will be number 20, and I will have put out 20 of these already, and it's crazy to think that we're already that far into the year. I appreciate you guys. Thanks a lot for watching this. I know that this is a real niche kind of thing, and not everybody is watching all of these or... And not all of our audience is interested in the series, but I'm just going to keep plugging away and doing them regardless of interest and view count and hope that there there is some interest. But I'm having a ton of fun with it. And like I said, it's getting, like I said right at the beginning, getting me back to my roots a little bit, just jumping around sampling stuff from all over my collection. I am really thoroughly enjoying this, and I hope some of you guys are too. Thanks again for watching, and happy reading.